This can't last. This misery can't last. I must remember that and try to control myself. Nothing lasts, really. Neither happiness nor despair. Not even life lasts very long. There will come a time in the future when I shan't mind about this anymore, when I can look back and say quite peacefully and cheerfully how silly I was. No. No, I don't want that time to come ever. I want to remember every minute, always, always to the end of my days. Welcome to Your Pick, a film podcast. I'm Geneva. And I'm Tatum. We are two friends who love movies and love sharing them with each other. Each week we take turns picking a film that is close to our hearts and talk about why it moves us, to tears, to laughter, and everything in between. We celebrate the craft of filmmaking, as well as the unique and personal ways we find meaning in the movies we watch. All right, Tatum, have you been watching anything this week? I... I have. Um, I feel like this is going to keep coming up in the podcast, and that's fine. Uh, but we're recording things far in advance before these episodes <laughs> are released. Um, but I... So first thing, I actually... I had a friend of mine who had not watched um, The Ultimatum Queer Love, which I think I mentioned a few episodes ago. So I watched that with her. Uh, it was great. We watched all of it in, like, two nights. It was fantastic. Uh, it's really great to rewatch it sitting next to someone who hasn't seen it before and kind of watch their reactions and ask them what their predictions are when I knew the outcome. Um, so that was really fun. I rewatched all of that show. Um, and also, um, the season two, the season two, season two of the bear came out, which uh, yes. if people remember, Woo-hoo. I've heard me mention this before. I worked on season two, uh, as the prop buyer. So I was interested Everyone to watch the bear season two and support Tatum. Yeah. Support, support, support Chicago, uh, television and, and filmmaking things by watching the bear. Also, it's just a good show. Um, but yeah, so I watched season two of that this week. It was really interesting to see how they edited it all together because, you know, I'd read all the scripts and everything. So I knew what was going to happen, but, um, it was really cool to see how they edited everything. And, uh, I won't, go super in depth into that here. Uh, but I would just say, I highly recommend that people watch it. Uh, it's, it's a very good show. It's a different vibe from season one. So if season one was a little bit too stressful for you, uh, give season two a chance. Cause it's, it's definitely got it's stressful moments and it's stressful episodes, but overall it's, a, it's a lot more, um, chill in my opinion and a lot funnier too. Um, so yeah, check out the bear season two. And also I still highly recommend the ultimatum queer love. It's very good. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's what I've watched this week. Nice. Very nice. Uh, well, I have been, um, I recently signed into canopy through my library card. And if any of you have a library card and your library is subscribed to canopy or to hoopla or to Libby or to any of those, um, types of digital content apps that libraries can give you access to. Take and you advantage not, of it. <laughs> yes, they are amazing. So I just recently finished listening to, uh, pictures at a revolution, the Mark Harris book that I mentioned a couple episodes ago about, um, the 1967 Oscar race. It's a fantastic book. And I just started his uh, book, Five Came Back, which is about uh, five uh, film directors who served in World War II. Fantastic book. Um, so I've been doing that through Hoopla. Um, but through Canopy, which is a uh, website that gives you ac- access to movies, I recently watched The Greatest Show on Earth, which was Best Picture winner in, I think, 1952. Uh, not a very good movie. <laughs> very long. <laughs> kind of boring. Um, the protagonists are kind of annoying. And yeah, I would just say pretty disappointing movie overall. Dang. But I wanted to see it to round out my, um, you know, continue working through the all the best picture winners. Um, I also watched, which I would recommend, this little movie called Pinball, The Man Who Saved the Game which I had never heard of, 
but it stars Mike Feist from um, West Side Story, who um, he's a, a Broadway actor who got big. Um, Dear Evan Hansen. In the non broad Yes, he was in the original cast of Dear Evan Hansen. He um, got big in the non Broadway scene by when he starred as Riff in the Steven Spielberg West Side Story. He's going to be starring in a Luca Guadagnino film called Challengers next year, or maybe later this year. I don't remember when it comes out. Anyway, I watched it for him, and he's super charming, <laughs> and it's a very charming movie overall. Um, it's about the story, true story, of uh, Roger Sharp, who was a, um, a sort of writer who was obsessed with pinball, which was banned in New York in the 1970s, and he played a part in helping to get it unbanned. So it's about that, but it's also really just the story of a person growing into adulthood and confronting, um, taking charge of your life and choosing to... Um, become part of a family and to make decisions that will bring you into maturity. And yeah, it's just an extremely charming movie. It's, it's pretty fun. I would recommend it. Is it a comedy? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, based on a true story, but told comedically, there's a sort of um, f narrative structure where supposedly the older Roger Sharp is retelling his story in flashbacks, although it's actually an actor. It's not the real uh, Roger Sharp. But there will be kind of jokes with it where he starts going off on tangents where he talks about like the dates that he has with the woman who becomes his wife. And the interviewer's like, can we get back to the story about pinball? And he's like, oh, fine, <laughs> <laughs> which is very cute. Um, so yeah, it's it's a very charming movie. I would recommend it. Nice. Yeah. And then um, lastly, I went and saw the recent at this time, although not recent when this episode comes out, Jennifer Lawrence movie, No Hard Feelings, um, yeah. I comedy have zero in theaters. I interest in seeing that. I, I was love, like, I love Jennifer Lawrence, but I'm just like, ugh. Yeah. Well, I was like, I love Jennifer Lawrence and I'm not a big fan of raunchy comedies, but I love the idea that studios are putting money towards um, big towards budget comedies. comedies. <laughs> toward big budget comedies, you know, that are not superhero films and not um like whatever else they put there uh, you know pre-existing ip so mm -hmm. i wanted to just go see it to support it and you know what it was a fun time it wasn't great it wasn't terrible it was a perfectly fun time nice so yeah that was what i've been watching good nice yeah all right so let's move on to the meat of the episode on a much more um sober and emotionally restrained <clears throat> note <laughs> Today on the show, we are watching Brief Encounter from 1945, directed by David Lean, starring Celia Johnson and Trevor Howard. Brief Encounter is a British romantic drama about two married people who meet by chance during their day out. Alec, a doctor, and Laura, a housewife, travel by train every Thursday to Milford, a nearby town, so that Laura can go shopping and Alec can work at the local hospital. Uh, to be clear, they are two people who are married to other people um, and have and children they, and have children yes they're middle-aged um established they kind of they have their own lives but over a series of weekly encounters the two of them go from casual acquaintances to friends to falling in passionate love however when an impulsive attempt to consummate the relationship goes sour they both realize that their relationship can't last Alec decides to take a job offer in South Africa, and the two of them spend one last day together before parting forever. So the screenplay for Brief Encounter was adapted from a one-act play by Noel Coward called Still Life. Its director uh, is the legendary David Lean, who is best known for directing the Oscar-winning epics like uh, Lawrence of Arabia and The Bridge on the River Kwai. Lean had been an editor in the British film industry for about 10 years before starting to write and direct his own films in the early 1940s. Brief Encounter is about the fifth film that he had directed. Much of what makes this film special is the restraint of its storytelling and its focus on ordinary life. Much of the film was uh, filmed on location at Carnforth train station. Uh, a lot of the scenes take place in this station um, or in and around the train. Uh, it was also filmed in locations around London and other towns throughout England. The dialogue includes familiar references to things like Boots Pharmacies and Donald Duck. <laughs> Much of the action is scored to Rachmaninoff, who, um, of course, is a 
pre-existing music. Essential to the story, too, is the socio-economic context of its characters. Laura and Alec are both part of Britain's middle class at the end of World War II, and the drama comes from the push and pull between the intensity of the emotion that they feel for each other and the strength of their cultural values, which prize controlling one's emotions and sacrificing personal pleasure for the sake of family and social obligations. All right, so this uh, was my second time seeing this movie. I oh, watched it. Interesting. I yeah. figured this would have been a movie that you like grew up watching all the time. I know, I know. It's kind of shocking to me that I had never seen it before. Uh, I think about two years ago was the first time that I watched it. Very much something that I kind of. I think I kind of knew going in. I would probably like, and I was still blown away by just how much it resonated me- with me. There are particular scenes in the movie that just for weeks and weeks and months afterwards, I just kept replaying in my head. I love the way this movie is filmed, which we can talk about, the the focus on the actors' faces and the how internal it is and how much it depends on little details and textures of the growing relationship between the two. Um, I'm definitely, <laughs> as Tatum knows, I'm an Anglophile, and so anything to do with kind of a... Um, the, the context of sort of British cultural life, especially in this time period, is something that's going to be of interest to me. But also, you know, I feel like I relate personally to some of the emotions that are on display in this movie, the kind of difficulty and struggle with expressing your emotions and um, the balance between showing emotion and feeling like you need to control it for the sake of the people around you. Um, something that I I can relate to and something that I'm attracted to when it comes to storytelling. So yeah, I really, really love this movie and I loved it just as much rewatching it. So Tatum, what about you? What what were your thoughts on seeing this? So watching this movie, I'm not kidding you, Geneva, the entire time I was watching this movie, I was like, this is a Geneva movie. This is a Geneva movie. (laughs) Really? What would make you think that? pretty much every single reason possible. I was like, it's British. (laughs) It's World War II. It's got romance, but it's got people being like, oh, but I don't know how to say what I'm feeling, but like, I feel the things, but I don't like that I feel the things, but I don't know, but, but, you know, like, so I, the whole, and also it's 1945 and the fashion and the aesthetic. And I was just like, this is, this movie was made for Geneva. (laughs) If, If this movie was made for anyone, it's made for her. So in that sense, I loved watching this movie because I was like, I feel like this window into my soul. Yeah, I was like, I feel like this movie makes Geneva really happy to watch in the sense that I feel like it helps her feel seen and all, you know, all of these things. Um, That being said, this movie is not for me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it, it similar to, similarly to how it hits on a lot of things that you like about movies. For me, it hit on a lot of things that frustrate me about these types <laughs> of stories in terms of, first of all, I'm not the biggest romance person when it comes to movies in general. Um, especially romances where people fall in love very quickly. I just, I don't, I was wondering <sighs> if that specifically would be an area of struggle for you. It, yep. I just, I'm like, this is you guys are grown adults like you know better why are you letting this go on for so long what are you doing you have families back home I don't know I it just got to a point where I was like either do the thing or don't do the thing you guys can't keep existing in this gray area of like I love you oh wait no we can't but I want to but we can't but I want to but we can't I'm like do it or don't do it I just ah So in that sense, this movie was very frustrating of a watch for me. Um, I'm very grateful it wasn't longer than it was because I feel like the story ended up getting a little bit repetitive for me over time. I was like, this is just, I I, I just, uh, do it or don't do it. Um, So, but that being said, I think that I I don't think that this is a bad movie. I see why people really really like. <laughs> oh, it. Oh, you don't think *Brief Encounters* a bad? Movie? No, I don't. I, I think I think it's Sorry. beautiful. I really it's just admi- like it's, it's like ranked number two in like 
British films of all time. Uh, yeah, like this yeah. movie sucks. <laughs> Just no, the it way doesn't. you phrased that was very funny to me. Yeah, like this. This is a very. This is a very good movie. I see and can understand why people really, really like it. It's just for me. Yeah, it hits on a lot of things that I find frustrating in terms of stories like this. Um, and I'm hoping that as we talk about it more, maybe I can pinpoint a few more reasons why it didn't connect with me as much because I'm an external processor and I found myself thinking while watching this movie that the, the content of the story, I feel like I could really appreciate if it was filmed in a different, not filmed in a different way, but like if the story was told differently, but I can't quite put my finger on what that is. So I'm hoping if we talk about it more, I can arrive at whatever that format would be. Um, because I see what the movie's going for. I don't think the story is bad, like badly told. I just was like, I think if it'd been made in a different way, I would have connected with it more. Um, but also I think similar to what you said about million dollar baby a few weeks ago, I think because the movie didn't connect with me as much, I was a lot more annoyed by the narration. I was like, there is so much narration in this movie and a lot of times it is not necessary at all. Like, I, I understand the movie's trying to be poetic and I get that it's like, oh, we're, we're glimpsing into her mind. She's telling these like emotional, romantic stories of how she feels. And, and I, I get that 100%. But it got to a point where like, I think there's this moment where she's getting on a, a boat going into the water and she puts her hand in the water and she says something of, you know, I put my hand in the water and it was cold. And then we rode away in the boat. And I'm like, I'm literally watching this happen. I can <laughs> see it happen. You don't need to tell me. And that happens a lot throughout this movie of just like, I walked to the train station and then I got there and there he was. I'm like, <laughs> I see you walking to the train station. I see you walking through the door. I see him sitting there. Like, I understand. Um, but again, I don't think that's an inherent problem to the film, but I think because I didn't connect with it as much, that was a little bit more of a struggle for me. Um, so I don't know. This movie was just kind of a weird experience for me because watching it, I was like, I feel like I should love this movie because it is beautiful. I do think that the story it's trying to tell is interesting. Um, and I think the acting performances are good. I, I think everything about the movie is fantastic. It's just for me, I... I just didn't, I just didn't connect with it yeah. as much. It wasn't um, for you. Yeah. And I think also th this is a nitpick, but I think it took a little bit too long in the beginning to get to the point of where we were going because I, I'm not going to lie to you, Geneva. I was so mad in the beginning of this movie because I was like, these are the most obnoxious people I have ever like they're just talking and talking and talking and rambling and it's so annoying and that's the point like she's she's emphasizing like these people are really annoying and i'm wait sorry this. which which people specifically so the whole opening part with the woman behind the counter and the police mm -hmm. officer which first of all yeah i the could not mr understand. godby and miss baggett i could not understand anything that they were saying like literally nothing i turned on the subtitles but they were talking so fast that i couldn't read fast enough to keep up but then I got to a point where I was like, I'm pretty sure all of this doesn't matter to the story anyway. It's just banter going on for a really long time. And then when that other lady comes over and sits across from Laura and she's just so annoying and then they go to the train and she's still being annoying. I liked how we got a different perspective of that at the end after we've mm -hmm. seen this whole story. And then you feel the weight even more of like, wow, this woman really is coming in at the wrong time. <laughs> Um, but the beginning, I was so mad. I was like, these people, I, I just, what are we doing here? This is so oh annoying. My gosh. <laughs> and, and I get it. The movie's trying to be annoying and it's trying to emphasize that with these characters. At least I think it is. Um, but it, I just was like, I, if this is this whole movie, I'm not going to be, which the movie wasn't, but right, right. anyway, not, yeah. um, that was just a lot of things right off the bat. But anyway, I, I, I think I can see why people love this movie. I understand why it is as highly revered as it is. It's just, it was not, it was not for me, but I am incredibly excited to hear your thoughts because like I said, I feel like this is a movie that you would be head over heels for. So I want to hear more about your relationship to it as yeah. we go on. Well, it's funny that, 
you know, I really was very curious about what your reaction to this movie was going to be, because as you say, in general, you're not a romance movie person, but there is that streak of you which really does Mm -hmm. love romance. I mean, there's that streak of you that loves Bright Star, which we're definitely going to do an episode episode on at some point. I'm very Mm -hmm. excited for it. And I feel like I can't, I have not yet been able to quite pinpoint (laughs) where that part of you yeah. lies and Me neither. <laughs> what what it is that makes a romance movie work for you versus one yeah. that doesn't one of the things that I love about the romance in this movie and I gotta be honest when I first started watching it I was a little hesitant because I specifically I struggle with any movie that asks you to sympathize with people who are having an adulterous relationship yeah I mean, that's just kind of my you know, it's my personal morals. Like, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's something that's just a bit of a block for me. I, I really do struggle with being asked to invest in that kind of relationship. And I think the thing with this movie that broke it down for me is the fact that every step of the way, the characters and particularly Laura are saying, this is immoral and this is mm-hmm. silly. We have known each other for such a short time. Mm-hmm. You know, our emotions are getting ahead of us. This is just foolishness. You know, we need to stop this. Every step of the way, mm-hmm. they are saying that. The head is saying that. And it's just, it, it's so much head against heart. It is, mm-hmm. this is a feeling, these are feelings that are coming in and are completely overwhelming any intellectual um you know, reasoning that they're putting up against it. And in the end, the intellect does win. The The sensible, you know, we have um, spouses and children and lives and we can't allow our feelings to completely sweep, sweep away everything that we have built. Um, that part of it does win. And so I, I, I do appreciate that, that there is that struggle to it. And for me, it almost makes it more romantic in the sense that it, it truly is something that This could never be, and you don't even fully know how they're going to process it. I mean, Laura says, I think is it I think it's the quote that I chose where she's like, you know, someday in the future I might look back on this and think, oh, it was just silliness, or, you know, kind of look back in it and laugh it off. But it's in the moment. These feelings are so strong and it's impossible. It's almost impossible to overcome them or to explain them away. And so yeah, that's that's one thing that I really love about this movie is that it is very explicit about the um, the head versus heart struggle. And a lot of respect and attention is due to, you know, is paid to that sort of the the reality of what they're doing and what they're going through and the effect that it would have on their um, lives and the, the people in their lives. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think. I think kind of going a little bit off of what you said and and connecting the dots to what you were saying before, I think honestly for me, when it comes to romance movies, in order for me to connect with them, I feel like I have to be able to connect with the protagonist. And there are a lot of romance movies out there where I'm like, this is not, I am not, I cannot relate to this character at all therefore I don't like it and I don't find it romantic because to me I'm just like I don't connect with this at all like this love story is nothing that would happen to me because I don't like it's just not how I live my life and I think this movie is something where I like I said you know I'm a little bit confused as to I feel like I could like it more if it was told in a different sort of way and I feel like I'm, I'm a little bit on the fence about it in the sense that I can connect with the sentiments that you just said of like, Mm -hmm. you know, I know that this isn't necessarily the best thing to be doing, but the head and the heart are in conflict. You know, I know that I shouldn't be doing this for X amount of reasons, but that doesn't change how I feel. And that's something that I connect with, which is why I'm like, okay, I I can get on board with what this movie is kind of going for here in, in that sense. But then on the other side of things, I can't connect with the idea of, well, I'm just not going to do anything about it. Like, I'm going to recognize that this is what I think and this is how I feel, but I'm just going to kind of not make a decision and just stay in this place of not making a decision and draw this out for a really long time because I'm not going to make a decision and I don't know what to do. And so I feel like for me, that's kind of why I'm on these two different sides of, I can connect with the sentiment, but if I was in that situation, I would recognize, okay, but at the end of the day, I have to make a choice and I'm not just going to, 
not make a choice for weeks on end type of thing. Yeah. Interesting that you view it as not making a choice. Because for me, it is very much about the choices that they make. It is sort of, I mean, they only have a total of seven encounters of which the first two are completely you know, super brief and in passing. It's really only on their third encounter that they actually start to spend significant time together. So five days together in which a lot of them are kind of them being thrown by, or seven days together, sorry, in which a lot of them that time is them being thrown together by circumstance. And um, I don't think it's them being thrown together by circumstance. She says all the time, oh, I probably shouldn't go back to that place on Thursday, but I'm going to go to that place on Thursday. Well, it's, I mean, it's sort of, you know, the first two is truly them being thrown together by circumstance. The third encounter is is as well. Um, they don't mean for anything to happen, and then it ends up happening. And then after that, they are making active choices to search each other out, and then they make an active choice to end it at the end. So I think a lot of this movie is kind of circumstances creating a situation and then reacting and making choices based off of that. I don't see it as a whole lot of drawing out um refusal to make choices because Hmm. they can only see each other once a week yeah i mean i guess that's just a difference in in our personalities because for me i'm like five 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 extra days to figure this out is too long like like you, you, (laughs) like you can't you know you have to be like oh this isn't working okay this can't work well let's end it now or uh I'm kind of into this so let's see where this goes you're like let's 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 try and do the thing it's like I I don't know they just take too long to be like I don't don't really uh, (laughs) I guess I'll go to the thing like I shouldn't go but I guess I'm gonna go and uh, it's so funny on the one hand you're like they have known each other for way too short of time for this (laughs) to be a problem and then also but they're taking way too long (laughs) so apparently Tatum meets someone and then then you know within two minutes she's yeah. like all right i'm either gonna have an affair with this person or we're gonna part forever <laughs> I, yeah i mean i don't know i i just it probably has something to do more so with like the fact that it's it's i don't know maybe time feels more sped up to me because it's in a film you know maybe if i were actually in her shoes and it was me living this for seven weeks it would feel different but i wouldn't i wouldn't do that because it's you have a family and children, but, um, I, I don't know. It's, it's just weird. Like I understand emotions, emotions are very powerful and, and especially, you know, the drug of love, it's very powerful or infatuation, love, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think this movie's more infatuation than love in my opinion, but, um, and, and like, I get that dynamic of that thing being such a drawing force that it's really hard to walk away and you're not thinking clearly. Like I understand that, um, which is why I'm just confused with this movie. Cause it's like, I understand, I understand and can relate to that sentiment, but for some reason it just goes to a place that I can't fully connect with it. Um, because I just, I, I, I don't know, make a decision lady. I just, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. She um, does. They do. After they get caught though, you know, it's just, I just, which by the way, his friend is super creepy. I don't know if he was supposed <laughs> to come off that way, but he was really creepy. Ah, uh, he didn't come off as creepy to me. More just very cold and ironic and sort of, I'm going to be very polite about this, but also express that don't I'm do this really again. disgusted by what you are doing. And please don't drag me into this. Please give me my key back. Thank you very mm-hmm. much. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, this is awkward. They are clearly not friends anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That mm, poor guy. Which, by the way, fun uh, fun fact that connects back to an earlier episode, apparently one of the inspirations for the movie The Apartment was Billy Wilder watching this movie and thinking, what would it be like to be that friend whose apartment is being mm. used as the spot for assignations by other that's people cool. that you know? And then I love that. And to turn that into a movie. Yeah. I feel like that's a classic filmmaker experience. If you watch something, it's like, oh, but what about what that about other person? Character? What's their yeah. story? You know? Mm-hmm. Um I, yeah, I felt like there were a lot of things watching this movie where I was like, I feel like The Notebook did that. And I feel like La La Land did that. And I feel like I've seen other romance movies do certain things that I don't know if they're direct references, but they're so obvious that I feel like they could be. Uh, or maybe it's just that this movie came out a long time ago and, you know, there's only so well, many I different mean, ways you can yeah, tell a, a love story. But It's a sort of 
touchstone, you know, one of the best romance movies ever made type of thing. So I wouldn't be surprised that there are a lot of movies that are referencing it. What, out of curiosity, what in um, La La Land specifically were you thinking of? I was just thinking of... I haven't seen The Notebook, but I have seen La La Land. Wait, you haven't seen The Notebook? Yeah, we haven't we talked about this? I've never seen The Notebook. It's kind of a know. point of pride for me at this point, honestly. I mean, I'm not going to say it's a movie worth watching necessarily. I'm just surprised that you haven't seen it. Um, if you're a bird, I'm a bird. Blah. Um, I just, I cannot. <laughs> yeah. I've never, I, full confession time, I've never really gotten the Ryan Gosling thing. I don't really understand why people are so in love with him and I feel like every time I mention this people are like well you've never seen the notebook so you know if you saw the notebook I, you would understand I'm I like don't okay know about that. <laughs> well fine you still haven't seen him in remember the titans his best role him <laughs> he in was remember in remember the, the, the titans. titans yes I've told you this before I think I sent oh, you wow. a video clip of him in remember the titans um but no, that is his did. best performance he plays a he plays a <laughs> I a saw a half of remember the titans in a health class in high school randomly and I never watched the other half he plays this like dopey country boy who's not really very good at football <laughs> that everyone's annoyed by um Aww. he's great though he he's such a baby in that movie he i mean he's so young yeah, I bet. well he's great in um i did recently watch the nice guys for the first time he's fantastic mm. in that movie that so movie's an odd movie um yeah. anyway did you ask me something yes yeah, sorry, sorry I <laughs> extreme what you tangent asked me. i asked uh what was the um la la land reference that you oh yeah well that's ironic thought. that both of those movies have ryan gosling in them i didn't even think oh about yeah that. i did not even think um, about that but so i mean it's not a direct reference but for some reason just the the idea of them going to the movie theater and just talking about movies and going to the theater together and oh, and sitting mm -hmm. there and having that tension of like is this a thing is this not a thing we're just watching a movie what's going on here you know for some reason that just made me think of uh of la la land but that was kind of that that reference in my mind yeah yeah well why don't we actually since you brought up the opening um sure. and the narration why don't we talk about that for a little bit this yeah. is one of the things that really really affected me the first time that i watched it and well and this time as well if i'm being honest uh, i remember actually the two of us having a conversation a while back where you asked like what are some of the movie scenes that will just stick in your head oh um, yeah yeah uh-huh you know, randomly. And this is one of the ones that I mentioned. So the the movie opens where um, it's a busy train station in a sort of a small town in England. And there's a, a cafe for people to sit in while they're waiting for their train. And it's sort of bustling. And there's this um, woman behind the counter and she's kind of flirting with the conductor, except she's mad at him because he didn't um, he canceled on our date or something like that. I don't remember exactly what. So it's kind of a comedic, you know, scene of life. But then the camera moves over to the corner and we see these two people sitting in the in a table and they're not really talking. And then all of a sudden this woman comes in and she sits down with them and she knows the the woman. So Laura, one of the protagonists in the movie. And then Dolly, this woman who comes in, she's a total busybody and she's just chattering away. She's like, oh, hi, you know, oh, you two sitting together, you know, I'm going to make mischief with so your annoying. husband. You're so blah, 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 blah. And the man gets up to leave and you don't sort of, you know, if you're watching this movie the full, first time, you don't fully realize what is happening, but you know that something is happening. And this woman has just walked into the middle of it and throughout this scene so the man leaves he kind of touches the shoulder of uh laura's shoulder before he leaves and dolly keeps on chattering and and laura's not happy and they get into the train car and dolly will not shut up and laura starts to voice over and she talks about how like i really wish that you were the kind of person that would be understanding and that i could actually confide in but you're not and so i just have to sit here and listen to you and pretend that i'm not dying inside which to be honest is a very relatable feeling <laughs> <laughs> at least to me i feel like i've been in that situation many times um but yeah that's basically the entire movie is then told through flashback as laura goes home and she's um she says goodnight to her kids and she and her husband are kind of sitting in the, the living room in the evening and her husband's doing a crossword and she's thinking, I really wish I could tell you what's going on to her husband. Like, you know, you are my best friend and you are such an understanding person. And if there's anyone in the world who could understand what I'm going through, it would be you, but I can't ever tell you. And then she basically just replays the entire story of her relationship with Alec through her mind. And so at the end of the movie... They get up to the present and they replay that scene at the train station again with slightly different camera angles that focus more on Laura's face. And at this point, you understand 
more fully what exactly Laura is going through because this is the point where she and Alec are saying goodbye forever and she wants to have these last few minutes to savor with him and it's just interrupted by Dolly just blundering in (laughs) and she will not shut up and Laura is so upset and she goes out and she kind of wants to throw herself on the tracks but she didn't and just Oh man, the <laughs> the way that I love the narration in this movie. I mean, I, again, I mean, we kind of talked about this with Million Dollar Baby and then also with Amadeus too. I can see how if you're not fully invested in it, it would be too much. I'm not going to say I disagree, but I love the way that it's structured and the way that it's set up. And just I think, that, I, I think the mm-hmm. writing, I think the writing of the narration is beautiful. Like I think, like I said before, it's very poetic you know i think it's very well written i i i think it's beautiful i just i just wish it it wasn't describing things that i could already see you know i really like when it gives the insights into what's actually going on in her mind and how she's feeling and the emotions like i think that that's great it's just the narrating of the obvious things in terms of you know when Dolly comes over and she's being really annoying, it's like Laura is saying, yes, Dolly wouldn't stop talking and she's being very annoying. You know, when she's describing her emotions, I think it's beautiful. It's just when she's talking about the other things, you know, for example, when, when Dolly comes up to the table and she's talking and interrupting and Laura just keeps saying, why she won't stop talking. She's being very annoying and she won't stop talking. Why is she still talking? I'm like, oh my gosh, you don't, you don't need to be anyway. So yeah, I, I just, I just want to clarify that it's not that I think that the narration is not beautiful or that it's poorly written. I think that when it is poetic and it's giving an insight into what she's feeling, I think it's great. It's just, it's so much that I feel like it just becomes too much so that there's moments when it's like, I don't think this necessarily needs to be here type of thing. Sure. What do you think though about the framing structure? The, I mean, that first situation of her with Dolly and the emotions of the scene and what they're going through and then the way that the movie comes back around to it at the end. Do you have any uh, thoughts on it apart from the the struggle with the narration? Yeah, I think it's beautiful. I love that that concept um, because like you said, you know, the first time we see it, you don't you don't understand the impact of what's going on. You know, you know that there's something happening and you know that based off of how Laura's talking about everything and how she looks and how she feels, you know that there's some sort of romantic something going on, but you don't really fully understand. And so, but I like how at the end, it really just carries this weight of this incredibly obnoxious person just cut short the final goodbye to this, you know, romance journey that these two people have had. And that's just incredibly just like really terrible you know I don't think she knew what she was doing but it just is really rude without her even knowing it so I like I really like that a lot and um I think I mentioned a few podcasts ago that I saw the movie Past Lives in theaters Past Lives actually employs a similar sort of framing dynamic where the opening scene of the movie is this dynamic of these three characters sitting at a bar and you and they're just talking and it's kind of like okay clearly there's something going on here, but we don't really know what it is. And then we see it again at the end after having all of this context. It's like, whoa, this really means something. So I think it's a really cool, I think it's a really cool, uh, I don't know if you can call it a framing device, but it's just, it's a really cool technique to include in storytelling. I liked it a lot. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I love the, when it's well deployed, I love the, um, the use of playing a scene twice but giving you different mm-hmm. contexts each yeah, time. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So that that um, part definitely hit me. Like I definitely it definitely impacted me at the end having that final moment of really understanding this whole thing is ending with a hand on the shoulder and you know that's it. Mhm. You know. Yeah. The hand on the shoulder which is such a beautiful little um little moment of intimacy which is just beautifully framed and the way especially the second time around because it's holding on Laura's face you can see her listening for the sounds of the train as you know it the the whistle goes and then the train pulls away and the narrator ex- narration explains that she's waiting for waiting to see if Alec is going to get off the train and come back and find some excuse to to not go and she's just waiting and hoping and it never comes and 
yeah, I just it, it's so beautiful to me. It's it, it's such a beautiful moment. It like I said, it, it really has stuck with me long after seeing this movie for the first time. What do you think about um and again, this could very well just be me bringing my own general themes that bother me in movies and projecting <laughs> it onto this story. But what do you think about Alec and his part in the relationship? Because I do feel like in the beginning, him and Laura are kind of in a similar place in terms of, hey, we just met. You're kind of cool. Let's go to the movies and hang out and be chill. Like, this is fun. Oh, wait a minute. I kind of like you. What does this mean? But I feel like as time goes on, I, to me personally, it felt like he was kind of pushing Laura a little bit in ways that she didn't want to be pushed, but doing it in very subtle ways that I was like, oh, this feels kind of manipulative. I don't know how I feel about this because Laura is clear the, clearly the one like saying no and saying no, but like you're not really doing anything to help her in this process. Like you keep pushing her along and it got to this point at the end. And I think Laura literally calls him out on it. You know, he says something in terms of um, if, if you want this to end, you tell me, you tell me, I'll do whatever you say. And Laura says, that's a lot to put on me, you know, and it's almost like they both know that it's wrong, but everything is on her to decide whether or not they're going to continue or not. And I feel like Alec keeps, I don't know if pushing her is the right word, but I feel like he's not necessarily being as attentive to her hesitancy as he could be. He seems to be really, really being a little bit more encouraging to taking her to places that she's not ready to go when she's very clearly kind of like really trying to pull away. So I don't know that that did kind of rub me a little bit the wrong way. And him just, in my opinion, love bombing her and just being like, I love you. I love you. I love (laughs) you. I love you. And she's just like, don't, don't say that. But he keeps saying it and saying, I'm like, dude, stop like clearly she's not in the same place as you but she is so troubled and and conflicted that she can't fully walk away and say goodbye because she is emotionally attached but you need to recognize that this is difficult for her not not saying that it's easy for him but I think that she seems a lot more tortured about it and he doesn't seem to be very uh helpful in her area of feeling internal like conflict about this but I don't know if you felt that at all but for me I was a little bit like dude you got like you gotta you gotta chill out a little bit she's not where you're at give her some space you know yeah I can see where you're coming from I think something interesting the the decision to frame this movie solely from Laura's point of view is a very Mm -hmm. interesting one because we see Alec only through Laura's eyes there are Mm -hmm. as far as I can remember there are no there's there's only one scene I believe of Alec without Laura. And that is the scene between him and the friend. I don't think we ever see Alec apart from that um, without, uh, you know, seeing it in some way through Laura's eyes. Um, I would say he, I, I do understand getting that sense. I don't think I saw it as manipulative. I think I just see it as more, he feels it first and he is more, open to expressing it, um, probably in part because he is the man, he's been out in the world and he doesn't, obviously he does have a wife and children, but I think it's a little bit different, especially in this context for a man to be expressing interest in a person they're not married to versus a woman who is so much more tied to that role within the home, the the sense of guilt and the sort of relationship to it is different. So I think, I don't think there's ever a time where what he's feeling is not what she's feeling. I don't think they're necessarily in this, in different places in that sense. I think it's just more, he is the first one who's willing to express it. And so he's always the one who has to kind of push her to be like, how do you actually feel? Do you really love me? And then she's always saying, yes, I do, but let's be sensible. You know, she's the one who's kind of being more pragmatic about it, but that doesn't mean that her emotions are different than the ones that he's expressing. So she tends to be the one who puts boundaries on it or puts limitations on it or says, well, we, yes, we do feel this way, but we need to also be considering what's um things outside of ourselves, whereas he's kind of the more romantic one, the more idealist one who's saying, but we need to also be considering our emotions and considering how we feel. Yeah. And and that's where it gets problematic for me. I mean, I think they're both definitely, I mean, 
I won't say love. I think they're both definitely infatuated with each other to an equal amount. I just don't like that she's trying to establish boundaries and he keeps trying to push the boundaries and it's fully within, at least in my opinion, she is the one having to say no to the boundaries. And he's like, why don't we go upstairs? And she's like, no. Or him saying, well, he says, why don't we go upstairs? She says, no. And he says, that's fine. I'm going to go upstairs and you can do what you want, basically. Like, he's I know, creating. That's, he, that's what I'm saying. Like, well, I'm saying that he's creating the opportunities and he's giving her the freedom to choose. I, I know, but that just, I, I don't know. That, that, that just bothers me. I, it's, she's, she's very clearly conflicted. So stop making it harder. Like, respect that she keeps saying that this is not good and she doesn't want to do it. And stop introducing these scenarios that are making it harder for her and putting all of this on her. You know, he's not, at least in my experience, or not in my experience, but in watching this movie, I didn't see him being like, hey, I see that this is hard for you. Maybe I can try and pull back. Like, is this too much? Would you want me to like, whatever. It's just a lot of, I want to do this thing. You tell me yes or no. And it's not, I don't know. It just, it feels a lot more forceful to me and you know especially and I think we see that at the end you know because I had this sentiment and I was like is this just me but then we see it later on in the film when he asks her like you tell me whether or not you want to do this and she says basically you're putting all of this on me and that's not fair and I feel like that is kind of how this movie works in terms of him wanting what he wants and knowing that she wants what she wants but then him knowing that she really is conflicted about it but him not really acknowledging that side of things as much and being like the full responsibility is on you, which like it is because it's her own life and it's her own decisions. And I get it, but also he's not really helping very much. I, I don't know. It's just, it's just, yeah, well, I, I it, don't know. It's messy. Yeah. I, I don't disagree that it's messy again. They only meet, you know, their entire relationship takes about seven is about seven weeks long. They are two human flawed people who have never done this from what we can see, have never done this before. Like, there's no clear flight path for them to take the absolute right moral choice at any given time. Like, he clearly is infatuated with her and wants to be with her and is very open and expressive about um, that fact. But he does respect her boundaries. And when she, when they finally come to that decision at the end that, no, this is a bad idea, we can't do this, he's the one who... <laughs> moves to Africa, basically, who makes that decision, I'm going to physically remove myself from this situation and makes that sacrifice of making a huge change in his life so that she can continue to to be exist, existing where she exists and not have to deal with seeing him um, every week and not them not being together. So yeah, I, I don't disagree that I don't think he acts morally completely perfect at any given time, but what human being would act completely perfect in every given in that sort of situation. So I have a question. I, this is something where I'm not sure if I was reading into something that wasn't there, or if there actually was a thread of this in the film, but it seemed like, and I don't remember exactly why I thought this at a specific moment, but was there some sort of discussion between the two of them at one point about them maybe running away together and trying to do that? And then, that I'm recognizing that that wouldn't work or no? I don't, not that I can remember. Okay, I mean, gotcha. maybe I just missed it, but okay. I don't think they ever get that far. I think the okay, furthest cool. they get is um, just kind of thinking maybe this can go on for a while the way it has been. And of course, you know, there's that... <laughs> There's that train ride home where Laura just keeps thinking about these sort of fantasy situations and she keeps imagining the two of them traveling the world and going to all these exotic locations together and being together. But it's in a very, you know, kind of a schoolgirlish fantasy. What if all of a sudden the world changed and we had met at a different time and things were completely different and we could be together and there was no sense of guilt? You know, it's not we've attached to there. any sort of. Yeah, yeah, we've all been there. You know, it's not attached to any sort of actual specific plans for her life and the sec second she gets home she's like oh yeah no that was that was all fantasy that's that's not reality can we just talk briefly about how 
Laura's son almost got hit by a bus and died. <laughs> I was like, you know, I feel like it, they could have done something where, oh, he has a sickness. and But I feel like almost getting hit by a bus and dying is really intense. <laughs> well, it's so funny because it's like she gets home and Fred's like, don't freak out. He did get knocked down by a bus, but yeah. he's going to be fine. And she's like, what? But it's like a couple hours later, he is fine. <laughs> she, Yeah. You know, the next day he's like, oh, yeah, like this is Eating super cake fun. Eating cake in bed. Me cake. I'm like, I'm pretty sure this kid would be traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's fine. I don't know. Kids are malleable at that age. You know, you can fall out of a tree and break your leg and six weeks later be fine i guess and in I this case know. apparently it wasn't you know it wasn't that serious i geez yeah it could have been i just i was like what <laughs> I, you know because i could see something where it's like oh he almost got hit by a bus but he stepped back just in time but this is like no no he got hit by the bus but in such yeah. a just a brisk way that he managed to survive yeah well he I just he got knocked down which doesn't sound like there was a direct impact it's just it was probably just the force of him getting knocked onto the pavement that was the um oh the, i don't know he injuries. had like bandages on his head <laughs> like, dang. Well, he probably bunked his little head on the pavement but i guess you know, no concussion it seems like yeah oh jeez anyway yeah, that, that, just, that just really caught me by surprise i was like whoa was like, oh. he, okay <laughs> so it's the 1940s the bus is probably going like 15 miles <laughs> true i don't know um but yeah yeah it's that's rough i mean especially the fact that she immediately takes it understandably as being some sort of karmic punishment for um i think that's after the first time that she spends significant time with alec and she starts to realize like oh i have feelings for this guy and to come home and immediately be like oh yeah well you weren't here your son was hit by a bus to be like Ugh. Uh. yeah but one thing i love about this movie though is how it depicts the sort of changeability of emotions in the sense that you know she because because we're following her so closely throughout this entire thing and this thing it's like it is it means so much to the two of them but also in the grand scheme of things not a whole lot happens they never actually consummate their relationship they do kiss a couple times like it's not insignificant but so much focus then becomes on the 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 minute detail of how they change from day to day and from hour to hour and so there will be a time when she's, you know, she's she's with Alec and she's swept up in it and she's like, okay, I think I really love this person. And then she goes home and she's like feeling guilty and then she sees her son and she feels guilty. But then a few hours later, he's fine and she talks to her husband and her husband just is completely oblivious. And so she laughs about it. She's like, oh, I must have been so silly. This is actually, I'm blowing this all out of proportion. And then she goes and sees Alec again. And she's like, okay, this is where she intends to meet. And she's like, I'm just doing that set of politeness. It's all fine. I'm going to end it and then he isn't there and she gets all worried and um is like oh my gosh i really want to see him again and then when she is able to see him only briefly after that she's like all of a sudden all those feelings come flooding back and i don't know it's just i love the way this movie portrays you know maybe this is just me but how many different ways you can feel about events how you can process an event one way and then a few hours later you're processing it a completely different way and your emotions can change according to those things um because I feel like that's very much how I can experience certain things in my life. You know, I think about something being very significant. And then a few days or a few weeks later, you're like, oh, actually, that was not a big deal. Or the other way around, something can happen that can seem fine in the moment. And then you find yourself thinking about it months later. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Any any thoughts on that, the way that emotions are processed throughout this movie? Yeah, I mean, this just... This just gets back into kind of what I was saying before in terms of everything that you just said. Mm -hmm. Well, not ev not everything, but a lot of the things you just said, I, I totally can relate to, you know, this concept of you, I mean, not in this exact scenario. I've never, you know, met someone at a train station and had this happen to me, but, you know, having this idea you of... You haven't? Oh, it's happened to me. Like, <laughs> haven't times. we just last week? <laughs> um, but But, you know, having some sort of feeling where you meet someone and you're like, oh my gosh, I really like them. And then you don't see them. And you're like, okay, well, that's probably not good for me. I shouldn't see them again. And then you're in a similar place where you might bump into them. They're like, oh, wait, but I'm here and I mm -hmm. want to see them, but you that's not good. You keep obsessing over like, yeah, where like, are they? Like trying yeah, to figure out. Are they going like, to come here? What happens so if I see yeah. them? What am I going to do? And then they show up and you're like, oh man, but don't, you know, like I, I do very, very much so relate to that. And, and I think, um, I just I wish I could put put my finger on the specific reason why I can't connect. 
I don't know. It's like intellectually, I understand. I have felt those things, but this movie never really gets to the heart for me. And I don't know why that is. It's like in my head, I'm like, yes, I can relate to that. I've been there. I know this, blah, blah, blah. But in terms of feeling anything, I didn't feel anything while watching this movie. So, which sounds terrible. Like, I don't, I don't know why that is, but, um, I guess to directly answer your question, like I, I agree with you. I do like the way that it kind of navigates and and shows the different ways that you can process scenarios and how you can feel lots of different things at the same time. And you can feel a million things in the course of a day and the course of a few minutes. You know, I think that that's very true to, to reality, especially when it comes to you being romantically interested in somebody. Um, but yeah. And, and, and I like the way that that's portrayed through Laura, I guess it's just for whatever reason, it doesn't fully, fully get there for me in terms of me being able to emotionally connect with it. Can, can I just bring up, uh, I really, you know, you kind of talking about how this movie is told from Laura's perspective, which I think is totally fine, but I'm also, I'm interested to see what this movie would be if we've seen it from other people's perspectives, because one thing that I really, really, really liked in this movie it might actually be my favorite moment of the film, to be honest, was at the end when Fred goes over to Laura and he tells her like, you've been a far way away or something like that. Like you've been a long way away for a while now. Thank you for coming back to me, you know? And I just, cause I just feel like so much of this movie is shown from Laura's perspective, which, which I don't think is a bad thing, but I liked that we got to see that, you know, Fred isn't this like, husband who's completely oblivious to his wife's state of being who just comes home and is like I'm gonna sit and read my newspaper and I don't care what you do with your time you know um and I thought that that was really really a nice addition to just kind of see that her her state of mind and her actions are affecting other people you know and um yeah I I just I liked seeing that um I don't know just like them them coming back together in that way at the end I, I thought that was really beautiful yeah. Yeah. No, I agree so much. I really love the character of Fred in this movie and the relationship that he has with Laura and how you can see um, the fact that they do have a really good relationship. You know, they they are very sweet with each other. They will, you know, they'll sit up after their kids have gone to bed and just talk with each other and make plans and make jokes. And it's not so much that, you know, that that Fred is a bad husband that leads Laura to contemplate having an extramarital affair it's more that there's this untapped kind of desire for romance that she hadn't really realized that was there that Alec awakens with her but within the her actual marriage it is a good marriage it's a healthy marriage it's very sweet it's very um companionable you know they are they do I think really genuinely love each other and the way that the movie ends, I love that you singled it out because it does show too that, you know, throughout the movie, Fred has been portrayed as kind of kind, but, but oblivious, you know, Laura will, um, Laura tries to tell him at one point about Alec and is like afraid about how he's going to react. And he's just completely sweeps it away, <laughs> which is kind of funny, but he, he's not a, oblivious. He does realize that there's something going on. And even if he doesn't understand what it is, he is concerned about her and he he wants to be close to her and he's glad that that she is um willing to I mean she's not never going to fully open up to him but at least willing to kind of be present with him in a way that she hadn't been for the last few weeks and so it does end I think end this movie on a more hopeful note which is really nice that even though these two people who have this special connection can never be with each other Laura, at least, and probably, I'm sure Alec, too, is going to be fine. Um, You know, she is going to be able to find a level of peace and contentment with her family and this decision that she's made, even if it's not going to be that kind of, you know, tempestuous passion (laughs) that she had with Alec. Yeah, I really like seeing this type of portrayal of of a husband during a time period like this, because I feel like in my opinion, there's so much trust coming from him that in my opinion, she takes advantage of. I I think she's definitely, I think she's definitely cheating. But, um, but you know, I think the fact that 
Because in my opinion, he's got a lot of grounds that he could kind of push and be like, what's going on? Because the fact that she's randomly hanging out with these people that she hasn't seen in a really long time, like mm-hmm. literally one of these women that she calls to cover for her. She's like, I thought you were dead. <laughs> you know? like, yeah. like these are people that she hasn't talked to or what was the other one? Like a librarian or something like some woman that I, I don't mm-hmm. know. Yeah. But, you know, he could be like, why, who are these people that you haven't seen in a long time that you're randomly hanging out with once, you know, like what's going on, but he doesn't, at least as far as we see, he doesn't push and he doesn't question. And I think that that's really, really nice that he trusts her in that way. I think it's really unfortunate that she's abusing that trust. Um, but I think that he, you know, from what we see, I do like that he is, you know, seemingly a good husband who cares for their child, who is attentive to where she's at mentally and recognize when she's not present and, but also like is not going to push her in certain ways, at least from what we're seeing, you know? Um, I will say though, <laughs> there was one moment in this movie that it just, it just made me laugh. Cause I was like, this is clearly something that in the 1940s was not problematic, but nowadays like it's really not okay. But uh-huh. it's, it's one of the scenes where Fred comes home and he sees Laura like doing something in front of the mirror. I don't know. And when she tells him, you know, Oh, I was seeing so-and-so today and we went out and got, we went to the theater together and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, Oh, how is she looking? She's like, Oh, she's a bit fatter or something. Like that. <laughs> and Fred's line. like, Oh, okay. That's nice. And then he walks over and he touches her on the shoulder or like puts his hand on her shoulder. She's like, why don't you stop with the beautifying? I want my dinner. (laughs) This is is quite the conversation. This is so not okay to first be like, how is this person looking? She looks fat. Okay. Can you stop making yourself look beautiful? I want you to bring me my dinner. I'm like, this is so weird. But for them, you it's might be meaning like, that in a more joking way. I know but it for, is a little bit like, for them. Well, it's clearly like a sweet little playful conversation. That's like, they're just chatting it up as husband and wife. No big deal. But in today's context, it would be like, what the, what are you doing? This is, ah. <laughs> but I just, I found myself laughing at that moment. Cause I was like, this is this is just crazy that people used to talk like this yeah. you've never uh, talked to someone that you um you know love and trust implicitly and they're like how is that person looking oh no put on some pounds it's like if you've seen somebody recently my first question is not going to be have they how are they weight or looking? not like I mean yeah. it's not even that's not going to be my first question I that's not going to not. be any of my questions I hope not <laughs> have they gained weight or lost weight because that really yeah. matters. How is it? How, how are they? How are they doing on their weight loss journey? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a great line, you know, just talking about that idea of her abusing Fred's trust, which she most definitely does. Where uh, toward the end, um, when she calls Fred to let him know that she's going to be back late that night, where she says, "It's awfully easy to lie when you know that you're trusted implicitly." So yes. very easy. Yes. So very degrading. Mm-hmm. When she said degrading, though, I was wondering, degrading to her or degrading to her husband? Because I was like, I feel like that's more degrading to him, but I don't know. Yeah, I degrading don't know. To both degrading, of them, I guess. Degrading to the relationship. I, d- I did like that they called that out, though. I-, I liked I liked that she openly acknowledged that. Well, it's like the, the sort of um, like uh, aborted attempt at a-, a tryst at the friend's house is kind of the the thing that jolts them awake to the sordidness of what they're doing, you know, when when they're not actually actively trying to consummate the relationship and it's just kind of taking romantic walks through the countryside and stolen kisses and in alleyways and things like that, it, it seems very sort of elevated and beautiful and romantic. But when the actual, you know, logistics of trying to find a place and then getting interrupted and having someone else intrude onto it you really and then you know running through the grain and getting sopping wet because you had to escape out the back door that's when the ugly side of it really starts to come out um and it's it's an essential moment for their relationship for them kind of taking that turn and being like oh actually you know we've been sort of justifying this to ourselves as you know it's this sort of beautiful abstract thing but actually the reality of it is it's it's, it's not bad. abstract anymore. <laughs> it's not abstract anymore. Yeah, it's it's ugly and it's sordid. Um, and we actually need to start making active steps to figure out what we're going to do about this because this isn't sustainable. And, you know, neither of them want to 
leave their spouses and blow up the lives that they have. And so we need to end this thing. I talked a little bit before about the how much I love the way that this movie is directed. Um, again, David Lean, <laughs> great, great British director, um, who was also an editor. I think there's some really excellent editing in this movie. I don't know if he actually had a direct hand at editing this movie, but um, again, the way it really focuses on Laura and her subjective experiences, there were some nice little flourishes that... Um, were really beautiful. There's uh, obviously there are a whole a lot of shots that are just directly centering on her face, and other people are talking off screen, but you're seeing her face specifically change um, as she's listening. I mean, Celia Johnson, incredible performance. We'll talk. She was nominated for Best Actress, and she's she has these massive, massive eyes that are just so oh, expressive. I wanted yes. to ask you about that because mm -hmm. this is not me at all saying that she is unattractive but I feel like for movies that were coming out at this time mm -hmm. she is not the beauty queen that yeah. other women looked like in movies at mm -hmm. this time and I wanted to know your thoughts about that because I wonder if it was a, an intentional decision to to cast someone with this look or if it just was kind of she's a really great actress and we don't care how she looks but I just feel like if this movie had been directed by you know, Alfred Hitchcock or Billy Wilder or whoever, you know, she would have been this supermodel of a woman who's glowing on screen. Whereas I felt like for her, again, she's not unattractive, but she's kind of weird looking, you know? And yeah. so I, I just, I wanted to know your thoughts on that. Like, I don't know if there's proof as to why they cast her, if there's actual facts for it, but I would love to know like your thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that you made that observation because I feel like I feel the same way. I feel like I I did come across something about her casting when I was doing research and now I can't remember what it is. I want to mm -hmm. say it's that she was kind of their first choice for the role that I think David Lee okay. had worked with her in his previous movie. And so he kind of, you know, envisioned her for this role. But I 100% I agree that she is she is beautiful, but she is very much not conventionally beautiful and she's also not she's not old but she's not young and it, that's so right, essential yeah. to their story as well the fact that they are both not only married but they're in their middle age you know they're, they're solid in their, their marriages they've been mm -hmm. together a while at this point yeah and they're they're past sort of you know youthful teenage you know puppy dog infatuations like these are people who've lived a bit of life and that's one of the reasons why these this situation that they find themselves in these emotions that they um, start to feel are so surprising to them is because they think that they should be past that age where these sort of infatuations can happen but, but yeah that's the thing you're never past that age, <laughs> which is why you need to be committed. Mm -hmm. It's like once just because you're married and you've signed a piece of paper doesn't mean that you're not attracted to other people for the rest of your life. You know, like if you have agreed to be in a monogamous relationship with your spouse, like that's a choice. You know, you have to choose. Might not be easy, but you got to choose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you got to keep on choosing. Yep. Um, yeah, which is what says makes Geneva this... and I. We're both very experienced in marriage. <laughs> we're giving all Two the people wisdom. Who've never been married, um, Speak but for yeah. Yourself. Anyway, I've been married for forty years. What? Yep. <laughs> wow. This is a. I'm actually breaking news. Years old. <laughs> um, That'd be crazy if I if I'm like. Guess what, Geneva? I'm actually sixty. <laughs> That's a weird. That's a <laughs> stupid a thought. I, I don't know why I'm even. Whatever. Let's get back to the, <laughs> to the movie. Um, anyway, but yeah, all that is to say is I do love that that casting and Alec. I mean, you know, he's a he's a good looking guy, but he's also older. His skin is not the greatest. He's got a receding hairline, but you know, you you can also see what she sees in him. Yeah, I wanted to ask because this is something that we haven't really touched on too much, like. Mm. Because I was kind of curious about this because I thought it was, in my opinion, unnecessary and just, like I mentioned before, incredibly annoying. What do you think about this side plot with the woman who owns this cafe at the train station and all of these, you know, officers kind of hitting on her and this one guy who keeps saying, hop it, hop it, hop it, <laughs> hop it. You know, I just thought it was a really strange addition. Oh, I like to it. The I, it's not that I don't like it. I'm just like, I don't understand why this is here. I feel like it's not adding anything to the story, but maybe I'm just not getting it. 
the way that I saw it phrased in a review that you know, as, as as I was looking up critical reviews of this, and I was like, oh, I hadn't actually even thought about it in these terms, but I think this is very true, is that this is, that subplot is serving as a kind of intentional counterpoint for what's going on in the main love story, because whereas the main love story is this kind of repressed, furtive, secretive thing, this is very open and very emotionally expressive. It's literally in front of the view of everybody. <laughs> but who comes into this cafe gets a whole dose of what's going on between Mr. Godby and Mrs. Bagot <laughs> this mm-hmm. week. Um, and it's between these two people who are just, um, they're probably like in terms of economic class, they're probably in a lower class um, than Laura and Alec, but they do feel able to able to kind of flirt in the open and they're more comedic and so yeah it's just kind of classic storytelling have the subplot that is kind of serving as a point of contrast between what's happening in the main plot gotcha okay i think i just was annoyed by by them yeah i don't know i i enjoyed them i like uh so st- Stur- Stanley Sternling oh, hang on sorry Stanley Holloway Stanley Holloway I've thank got you. it all pulled up right here <laughs> okay thank you yeah so he's a he's a character actor who's just been in a million things and I always enjoy him I'm not super familiar with the lady who plays the um Mrs. Bagot but I enjoyed her kind of prim kind of Victorian um aesthetic as this sort of you know she's like oh I'm just you know such a cultured lady and I'm not going to respond to these vulgar flirtations but also where were you last night you said you were going to take me to dinner (laughs) yep yeah (laughs) it's very cute and then the the moment later on where um you know after the whole movie where she's like oh stop it you're being so ridiculous stop flirting with me in front of everybody and then um these two soldiers come and they're being super obnoxious and he chases them out and she's like and tells them oh, to hop thank it you. hop it and hop she's it. like oh thank you mr godby and he's like oh nothing nothing to it ma'am anytime <laughs> anytime and he gets he's all excited about getting to be her what knight in shining armor i just found it very cute yeah, he finally got to he finally got to rescue her in the way that he's always wanted. I just thought it was a, an interesting like thing that they just added in there, just in little scenes. I was like, okay, all right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do find it interesting actually. This is kind of a this is very much a tangent, but I feel like watching older movies, I feel like the relationship between humor, it particularly in a movie that is overall a drama, is very different. Where. Hmm. I think a lot of movies today, if something is a drama, then it all has to be serious. And you might have like one or two lines that are more lighthearted, but I don't know. I feel like because I I was just recently watching this 1930s movie called Mutiny on the Bounty, which is a sort of in the sort of adventure genre. But it's about this captain who's very abusive to his crew and is like straight up causing them to die in the horribleness of the discipline that he's exacting and it's it's very serious but there's also these like jokey comedic subplots with sailors being goofy and doing things and i'm just like i I don't know this like this tone seems very strange to me but it's also i think there's more particularly in a a hollywood film which brief encounter is not um but i think in, in hollywood films especially there's that sort of we have to be playing to every corner every quadrant you know there has to be the there's the drama but then there also has to be the comedy and there has to be the romance and you know that sort of thing anyway yeah um anyway oh i was i was talking a little bit before sorry about the the way that this movie is filmed and shot and i just wanted to point out there's one specific moment that i really loved so when we see the scene that we talked about before the the full circle scene the the parting at the train station when dolly comes up and starts chattering and is um, bothering and preventing Alec and Laura from saying their final goodbye. There's this really amazing shot. Um, so as as Alec leaves and the express train is coming through, so it's this train that comes through and does not stop because it's an express train. As you hear the train approaching, the camera slowly pushes in on Laura's face, but it's also tilting in this way that... Um, you know, sort of classic, but not probably super widely used at this time, kind of very subjective filmmaking where you're you're seeing this idea growing on Laura's face. And as the camera's tilting, it's kind of everything going off kilter. And then at that moment is when Laura makes the decision to run out and attempt to jump in front of the train, which she ultimately does not do. But I just really, I don't know if you noticed that 
particular scene and just the filmmaking of it, but I really love the way that that scene is constructed and the way it gets you into Laura's head. So then she runs out and there's this very quick cut of the train running by and then it's just a long hold on her face and the, the lights of the train are flashing almost like strobe lights and the wind is blowing and you just see her face as everything just kind of drains out of it. And in voiceover, she talks about how she's just kind of becoming, she says, like, I didn't jump, but the reason I didn't was not because I was thinking about my husband and children and the effect that it would have on them. And I just kind of, I felt like I couldn't feel anything anymore except the desire not to be unhappy, Um, Mm -hmm. which, yeah, I think it was just such a beautiful and sad moment. And again, very, just really great filmmaking that gets you into that, you know, kind of very relatable feeling of you know just so much sadness and tiredness and anguish and just kind of wanting to not really being able to feel anything you're just kind of numb does that does that happen in the forgive me but I'm just not remembering correctly does that happen at the beginning of the movie or does that happen at the end the end so in the beginning all you you're seeing it from dolly's point of view which again i love i love it when movies execute something where you see one scene um from one perspective and then you see the exact same scene later but from another's perspective so at the beginning of the movie you see from dolly's perspective she gets up and goes to the counter to buy some chocolate and she turns around and laura is gone she's like where'd she go and then laura comes back in Mm -hmm. and looks tired but what we see the second time around at the end is what Laura does when she goes out and what she does is run out and sort of half-heartedly try to throw herself in front of the train which she doesn't but um, just kind of the all the emotions that are going on through her I don't think I picked up on that at the end and maybe that's just because I wasn't paying enough attention but I didn't I didn't realize that she was considering jumping in front of the train but that's just me. I yeah. probably just wasn't paying enough attention. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it made me, it was very like, um, basically the British uh, answer to Anna Karenina, where in Anna Karenina, the um, middle-aged woman has a passionate affair and ends by her throwing herself in front of the train. Whereas in this, she stops herself from completing the passionate affair and does not throw herself in front of the train. It just kind of go, goes home. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Very British. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, again, one thing that I do like about this movie, again, with the idea of um, how people process emotion and processing things different with the um, the length of time is I think it to some extent leaves open the question of how they are going to think back on this episode in their life. And Laura in particular is constantly bring, bringing up this idea of passion as being something that is silly, you know, something that's foolish. And again, there's that sort of push and pull between, oh, this is silly, like in- rationally, intellectually, we know that this is dumb and these are bad decisions that we're making, but these are still the genuineness of our emotions. And I did lo- <laughs> love in the movie how they have this sort of fake trailer for a movie within the movie oh my called gosh. Flames I- of Passion, which I thought was hilarious. I was actually thinking that while watching the movie. I was thinking, is this the first time we've had a fake movie made to go (laughs) inside to be like inside of another movie? Mm -hmm. Because that stuff, you know, that's not stock footage. That's like they go out and they film a (laughs) fake movie and do all that. I I just was very interested in that. I was like, oh, that's that's cool. I know. Yeah. I can't say if that's the first time it's ever been done, but I I found it really funny. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's let's wrap this up. Um, so in terms of the um, critical legacy of this movie, so right now, I mean, this again, it's kind of hard to get an accurate reading on these sorts of things um, when this movie is like 70 years old. But <laughs> Metacritic right now has this movie at a 92. Rotten Tomatoes has it at 91%. Uh, at the time, this movie was nominated for three Oscars. So it was nominated for Best Director for Dave Lean. His first of many nominations, Best Actress for Celia Johnson, and Best Adapted Screenplay. And I pulled one quote from You a... said it's adapted from a play? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. A Noel Coward play. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so I pulled one quote from a critic. So this is a, a recent kind of retrospective review on this movie. So this is Vikram Murthy, or Murthy from IndieWire. He writes... 
David Lean's brief encounter captures love at its most ephemeral. It depicts the emotional affair between two middle-aged married people, aware enough to know their relationship is unsustainable, but too helpless to stop themselves, like they're witnessing the slowest, most beautiful car crash in history. Housewife Laura Jessen and idealistic Dr. Alec Harvey move furtively in the shadows of British suburbia, hiding their love from their families and the repressed society, wanting to hold on to each other for as long as they can until the inevitable happens. They are just two ordinary people who live ordinary lives, but for a brief period of time, the two of them stand on the edge of something extraordinary. I like that. Yeah, I really like that too. And um, Murthy's review is overall is really good. He he hit on some really interesting points and made me think about the movie in, in some um, interesting ways. So I would recommend if you're interested in reading more about this movie, looking that up. Yeah. All right. Final thoughts. So I already talked about that one particular scene and how what an impact it has had on me. Again, this is just a movie where I feel like I, uh, and again, this is this is very subjective. You know, this is this is my a particular movie. personality <laughs> and yes and sort of all of my different interests coming together but this is one where I do relate very strongly to the uh, protagonist to Laura not in terms of the situation she finds herself in but in the way that she kind of processes her emotions and experiences the world and makes you know tries to balance the things that she's feeling against the the intellectual rational ways that she knows she needs to act so yeah, that's just really stuck with me for a long time. But um, Tatum, do you have any final thoughts or anything with the movie that you do think might stick with you? Yeah, I mean, I I feel like the two moments that come to mind are I really liked the hand on the shoulder when mm. what's his face Alec Alec was leaving. Um, I just thought that to be a really I don't know just a really impactful ending to their I'm not going to say love story to their infatuation story. Um, it was very anticlimactic but in a very climactic way (laughs) if that makes sense um I just I really I thought that was a really interesting choice and and I liked that idea of of seeing something at the beginning and then seeing it again at the end with a totally different not a totally different perspective but just having the actual context for the situation um and then again I really liked Fred kind of speaking to um to Laura at the end and just telling her you know you've been a a long way away. Thank you for coming back. I just found that to be a really beautiful, I don't think it's the final line in the movie, but it's one of the final lines. And I just thought it was a really nice way to kind of show that in my opinion, this is a happy ending. You know, she's, she's coming back to a family with a person who loves her and cares for her. And this isn't a tragedy. It's just a, you know, back to normal, back to reality type of thing. And that reality Mm -hmm. is not bad. So Yeah, it was a brief encounter, a sort of brief stepping outside (laughs) of (laughs) your normal day to day life. And you'll come back and you're a little bit changed, but also you're coming back to and reappreciating what you have. Yeah. Yeah. Go care for your son who almost got. I know. (laughs) Make sure he's okay. (laughs) Maybe don't put him in the Navy Um, (laughs) or do. I don't know. I don't (laughs) know. World War II just ended, so I don't think they need him anymore. Yeah. Um, Anyway. (laughs) All right, Tatum, do you want to uh, tell our lovely listeners what we're going to be covering next week? Ooh, lovely listeners. Yes, get ready for next week. Um, So I don't know. I'm assuming our listeners, at least some of them, know about Studio Ghibli. Studio Ghibli, I still don't know how to say it, even though I've known it. You should probably find that out before next week's episode. Yeah, I'll do some research. Um, (laughs) (laughs) It'd probably take five seconds to actually figure it out, which is. Why haven't I done that before? I don't know. But uh, Studio Ghibli is an animated uh, studio from Japan uh, created by Hayao Miyazaki. He's made some of the best animated films, in my opinion, to ever grace the humankind. They're pretty incredible. (laughs) Um, I don't know if this is my favorite. If it's not my favorite, it's my number two. But I think it might be my favorite Ghibli film. Uh, The Wind Rises from 2013 is what we'll be talking about next week. It is a beautiful meditation on so many things, as a lot of Miyazaki films are. But it, it's it's a beautiful medita- meditation on war, the impact on war, um, and also having dreams. And what does it mean when those dreams give you life purpose? Is it a good thing to have dreams give you life purpose? What happens if they don't happen? What happens if those dreams are destructive? It's just... It's a very moving film that I personally find to be uh, 
very triggering of existential crisis. <laughs> it it, it creates an existential crisis for sure, at least for me. Um, so yeah, I think there's going to be a lot to talk about next week. I think this is a film. I think the last few films we've had have just kind of been like, one of us likes it. We're not sure if the other person is going to like it. We'll see what happens. But this is a movie where I think both of us are really going to like it. Um, if you don't like it, that's fine. But I think we'll both have a lot to talk about. Um, cause it's, it's a really, uh, touching film. So yeah, the wind rises next week. Yeah. I'm excited because, uh, Spoiler alert for the episode. This is going to be my first ever Miyazaki film. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, hopefully you'll go on a Miyazaki binge after this. I mean, there's <laughs> hopefully, there's yeah. so many great Studio Ghibli films. I think I've seen all of them at this point. Um, but yeah. Well, thanks everyone for listening. Bye-bye. Yeah. Talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at yourpickpod at gmail.com. Our theme song was composed by, composed by Joel Rushton, and our podcast graphic was designed by Kara Shin. If you like this show and want to hear more, please rate and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We're excited to have you on this journey with us. Until next time. Music